Hello, everyone. I am joined today by Unified MMA's Bobby Poulter. Bobby, how are we doing today? Doing great, man. As Love every day. It. Love to see it. So, uh, how did you find out that XMMA card was canceled? You were originally supposed to fight on April 7th, and the fight was canceled. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, man. So, I was supposed to fight. I took it on uh, relatively short notice. I had, I had another fight fall through. So, I took it on about two weeks notice. Um, supposed to be April 7th in Myrtle Beach. And uh, I found out via Facebook post. So, I had uh, one of my buddies, Mike Malott, who was supposed to be coming down with me to Myrtle Beach um, to corner, he calls me up and he's like, hey, buddy, just, I heard a rumor that the fights might be canceled. I'm like, whoa, like this is, it's crazy. I was like, I didn't hear anything at that point. So I immediately dialed up my manager, Jake from Ruby. And uh, he's, he's like, no, man, we haven't heard anything. We heard they might have uh, security staffing issues, but they said that worst comes to worst, they're just going to run an event without any fans. Okay. Um, and then about two hours later, one of my one of the guys that I'm training with at the gym just pulls out his phone. He's like, "I'm so sorry, man." I'm like, uh, "Sorry for what?" And he's like, "Oh, this." And he like showed me a picture of his phone, and it had the canceled event sticker logo over the event. I'm like, "Well, damn, this is this is great." I immediately sent it to my manager. I called him, and he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, I'm gonna call him. I'm gonna talk to them right now." But they haven't reached out to us or anything. So we were in the dark. We just they posted on their Facebook that they were canceling the event. Um, and honestly, man, I was baffled because it was Monday night and I was supposed to be on a flight the next morning at 8 a.m. And I was cutting weight or sorry, I was water loading at that point, ready to cut weight. And it, yeah, man, it was just, it was fun. It, honestly, it was, it was just kind of sad how they handled it because, you know, shit happens. I completely understand the fight game is, is, is hard, but to find out via Facebook post. They didn't even tell me about, you know, I was still packing and shit. Like, fuck. Like, yeah, let us know. I mean, it's a horrible way to find out that you're just not going to fight. You didn't even find out through the promotion. You didn't find out from anyone other than a friend at the gym that showed you a post. Yeah, man. And they, like, they didn't, they didn't give me anything for my time. They didn't even reach back out. As far as I'm aware, they didn't even reach back out to my manager after. Really? Um, they said, yeah. So I was like, well, that's it. We're not. We're not even looking to get, because they ended up rescheduling the show a couple, like a day later, like we're going to do it May 3rd. And we're like, fuck that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I would, if I, if I was you, I probably wouldn't have in that situation either. Yeah. Like it's, I've had, I've had some rough luck with fights, but just that, you know, shit does happen, but that kind of, it's, it's very disrespectful. So no, I would, it's I would, disrespectful would, and it's disappointing. I mean, you put in all that effort, yeah. all that work. I mean, how many, how many weeks were you in camp for, at that point? Well, so I had done a camp, a full six week camp yep. to fight in Indiana, yep. which that fight got canceled at the while we were I was at the venue, mm -hmm. wrapped up, ready to fight. Obviously, I'm sure you heard about that story. Yes. Um. So, you know, we came back. I was like, I need something. Like, we tried to get on the BTC card two weeks later, nothing. So we ended up getting on uh, that that uh, XMMA card, which was okay. great. You know, a great opportunity, a yeah. big show. So I had about another three weeks, another three weeks of training, okay. and uh, it, it, honestly, man, it was it was it was a great three weeks. I love I love those short camps because I'm always training, I'm always in shape. But uh, you know, you know how it is. I try to take a week off work. Like it's tough, yeah, it's tough no. to yeah. recoup that money. But yeah, so that's why it was unified. I'm hoping things are only up and up from here. Okay, I, I'm hoping the same for you. So I wanted to ask yeah. you. So how did you end up signing with Unified MMA? So through Rob Beavers, you know, Rob, Rob and I okay. have worked together previously. With the, even before I had a manager, I was working with Rob to get fights through okay. BTC. He was also reaching out to other promotions for me. Like, he was very supportive to me. Um, so when he made the switch over from BTC to Unified, they offered me a great deal. Um, and then Jake Sage from Ruby, I started working with him about the same time. And they managed to collaborate and find a great deal for me. And they they seem like they have my best interest in mind. They seem to want to be setting me up for for future. And I I'm it seems like everything's everything's going according to to plan. So I'm that, that's I'm happy. great. That's amazing. That's how everything should be going is according to plan. Yeah. I mean, that, that, it's great to hear. I mean, Unified is one of you know Canada's biggest MMA promotions. So it's definitely oh, one yeah. of the better places to get noticed in if you want to uh, you know further oh, your yeah. career. So. It's definitely good to see you get signed somewhere so big. Yeah, man, it's it's, it's, it's 
fights. You know, they, I used to watch their cards when they first got on Fight Pass back before I had even had any amateur fights. <laughs> I was like, damn, I want to fight for these guys one day. Well, uh, man, so you it's, the chance. Uh, yeah, man, I'm amped. I'm ready. I'm June 23rd. We got a matchup. They haven't released the card yet, but okay. it's going to be it's going to be a good one. Man. So that's what it's I wanted to ask. Good. So you fight June 23rd. Um, so you don't know who you're fighting yet? Who you're fighting yet? So I had an opponent. He uh, unfortunately pulled out uh, a couple days ago, and uh, but they did find another guy. And we're just uh, we're just shoring up the details on the contract. So okay. it nice. seems like pretty sure. Yeah. So you know we got time, so I'm not stressing about it. I'm obviously just training and doing my thing. But uh, otherwise, man, it's just yeah, it's, we're just waiting, waiting to hear the the final details. But I'm gonna be on the card, and I think they'll release in the next day or two. All right, that's great to hear. All right, I can't wait to hear. Um, but I wanted to ask you about your relationship with Aaron Jeffrey. So you have been best friends with Aaron Jeffrey for a while now. You guys have been training together for years. Just tell me a little bit about that relationship. Oh, man. Me and AJ have been training partners for, God, I don't even. I remember training for, like, my first amateur fight probably seven years ago, back when Parabellum was still around. And uh, he was, like, he, he was the guy that was on the come up, and I was just an amateur trying to make my way through the ranks. And – there was just nobody that wanted to train with AJ because he's such an animal. <laughs> and uh, so I got, I got, I ended up doing a lot of rounds with that guy. Okay. And uh, okay. over time it just, it, it slowly grew. And now like whenever we need each other, like even when we have fights, we're mimicking with fighters. Like it's, it's become, it's, it's become a point where I never don't have a training partner. Okay. So, and that's, that's the hardest thing, especially during COVID, man, there was, there's a lot of bullshit going on. Where people didn't some people didn't want to train anymore some people were thinking about stop fighting and so i didn't have a lot of training partners but throughout covid i literally trained with aj every single day for probably eight months just reps and it was it was great man so it's 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 been a journey we've been we've been through a, a lot of fight camps together you know first contender series he's helped me so much for my fight camps as well like the pace he puts on me is just crazy and if i can survive even rounds with him when i go out there i have the confidence that i can put anyone out that's it's great to have someone like that that you know is like you know so much like farther in their career and that they're constantly just being able to push you and push you and push you and just you you have that in aaron just where you guys have that you know he's he's kind of the veteran in your relationship in a sense even though he's not really one and he's just constantly pushing you and pushing you and pushing you. And the more you get pushed in the gym, it's just making the fight so much easier for you. And you can tell how much better you're getting in every single fight. You just keep constantly improving. And you see that. Oh, yeah, man. In this, in this sport and the guys that we train with here, like the big guys here, like the heavier guys, probably above 170, mm -hmm. it's kill or be killed here, man. These yeah. like every yeah. single guy I train with at welterweight or above is a fucking killer. It's it's ridiculous. So like I got thrown to the wolves, and you know you become part of the pack. And seeing those guys go out there, and there's been a lot of times in my career where I try to kind of relate to these guys because you know there was times where I've really struggled to find fights. I've seen Aaron go through the same th same thing, and as hard as it is to do, it's like I see them go through it, and they get through it, and they get to something even better. It's like, yeah. man, that that's like that's what keeps me going sometimes. Is just seeing where they're at and where I can go. So not just Aaron Jeffrey, but also guys like Mike Malott. Tell me your relationship with him and how he's also helped you out. Man, in the last eight weeks, Mike's been like a like a big brother to me. He's been amazing, man. Um, he came back here. He moved from Sacramento, and uh, ever since he came back here, it's been it's been awesome. I have never had a welterweight that's that's really been at my around my weight that isn't cutting a crazy amount of weight we're like similar body types um who's got he's got a vast amount of knowledge we do a lot of training sessions together he, like when i whenever i have a question about he's like a i have a question about anything he's like a an mma dictionary that man can break down anything so like whenever i'm i'm not sure about something or have questions like that man is like he's the he's the real deal man i'm excited to see where his career goes because he's you know I, we weren't really super close for a long time because he wasn't around that much. He was always down in Sacramento, but since he's moved back, he's, he's become my main training partner. Like the last, okay. yeah, the last fight camp, like, man, I remember there was a couple Saturdays where we just three rounds straight, four rounds straight. And it's just, you know, it's like, a, it's like a fist fight with one of the best, probably the best welterweight in Canada. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he, he just got his fight announced yesterday against Adam Fugue <laughs> yeah. in Vancouver. Man, so he gets to represent in Canada in your hometown. Well, not in your hometown, but in your home country. So, Hey, man, I'll great. take it. Home country, yeah. I don't care. I'm just happy he's getting a fight, man. He's been yeah. training so hard. He trains, and not only hard, but he trains so smart. Now, like, he, he needed to get this fight. I know he, you know, through all the fights are getting announced. It's like, they announced another one. They announced another one. I'm like, when are you going to get? Yeah. Like, the, the he's probably the biggest prospect right now in Canada. Like, get oh, he is. A yeah, he is fight. by far. Definitely. Yeah, so I was like, I was just, I'm, I was, there was a bunch of names that got thrown around. You know, you're trying to get Robbie Lawler to fight. Uh, there's so many names, but so this, this Adam Fugit guy, I've seen him before. It's, it'll be a great fight. I'm, this is a great matchup for Mike. So uh, when you say he trains smart, tell me what you mean by that exactly. Well, that's one of those guys that, you know, he's been around the game for a while. He's been around the game. You know, he's, he's coached at the highest level. He's traveled around the world. Like when he comes in, he's not always like, Hey, I'm going to train balls to the wall every time. Like he has a very technical approach to the game. And that's something that I can really appreciate and something that I try to, I try to emulate in my own because man, when I first started, the only thing that got me through was being a workhorse. I just worked hard all the time, but that just, you know, at, at some level, once you get into the level where Mike's at being a hard worker, isn't enough. You got to train smart. You got to be intelligent. You have to fight smart. You have to, train smart every day because this sport is fucking brutal yeah so you know if he's if he's hurting he knows his body well enough that he's got to go lighter or he modifies his training um the situations he puts himself in like it's 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 very it's it's very creative but also very thorough and very like almost like clinical like he knows exactly what he's doing and he does it step by step okay I mean, it makes sense. I mean, after you're in the game for so long, you need to start prioritizing your health at some point. If you just keep yeah. putting all the effort in and all the effort in, you're going to be, one, riddled with injuries, and two, so many problems post-career, it's just not going to be It's not going to be worth it in a sense. So I, I completely understand, and I, I love that Mike is, like, instilling that of in all the fighters to train more smart. I like that a lot. Something you don't 100%. see a lot today. I, I completely agree, man. Like you go to a you go to an MMA room, you're gonna see eighty percent of the guys in that room, maybe even ninety. They are hard fucking workers. They're mm -hmm. not lazy. But like that ten percent is gonna be the difference between being a, a smart fighter. Like, you can be a good fighter because you work hard, but you're not gonna be great unless you're smart and intelligent by the way you go about things. You're a hundred percent right. <laughs> so you've recently had fights at lightweight and middleweight, but now you're here fighting at one seventy again. <laughs> Tell me if you figure it out that that's the weight class that's right for you or just if you just wanted to fight at 170 again and give that a go. Yeah, man. So I started my, my amateur career at 170 and it was, you know, it was great. I, I was a little smaller then. Like I had, I didn't really cut much weight. Okay. You know, I remember when I fought it and when I fought a rebel, like I cut like five pounds. I was walking in there at 174, 175. Like I wasn't, I wasn't very big. Um, but when I first uh, made the cut to 55, it was it was challenging, man. I did it. I did it two or three times, and it it took so much out of my body because I walk around at like one eighty five, one ninety, like that. It was just it was too much. It was it was too much, especially because I did it a, a, on short notice a couple times. I was having serious uh, health issues okay. after each cut, and it, it didn't allow me to fight often. Um, and it actually ended up making me heavier after my fight, which I never would have thought. But like after my fight, man, I would get up to 190 195 sometimes close to 200 and it and i wasn't even eating anything differently it was just my body must have just been pissed uh, so, so so basically every time you cut the next cut would be 10 times harder because you would have more weight on you yeah, yeah. and i was also you know i was 21 when i made my first cut to 55 22 and i like i just get i was getting a little bit bigger each time and i was like what is going on Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so when I made my pro debut, my last amateur fight was 185 or 155. And then my pro debut was 180. Okay. And, uh, that was, you know, I didn't cut anything for that fight, but it was a great okay. matchup. So we took okay. it, but we knew I was going to be back at welterweight. Gotcha. gotcha. Again, again, I'm kind of an in-betweener, you know, I mm -hmm. wish a 165 division was a real thing, but, um, you know, I truly believe that to be noticed, you have to be in a real division. So I don't really want to fight at 165 unless it's a perfect opportunity 
you know, there's no reason to ever make that extra cut. And, you know, I'm, I'm starting to fill out my frame. I'm 26. I'm still probably going to put a little bit of weight on. I walk around like 185 right now. It's, it's a perfect weight cut to 170. It's, it's yeah. challenging, but I'm not like, I'm not having any repercussions from it. So yeah. I think that's the there's way to no, go. There's not going to be any issues with yeah. the 15 pound cut. Yeah. Especially. Nope. Because, so how much, how much of that would you say comes off? Like just like naturally while training or is it, are you cutting 15 pounds? No, I'm probably, I'm starting fight week at about 185. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I, I probably, I, I don't like, man, I'm honestly training all the time. I might, I'm always on my strength conditioning. I'm always on my diet. So I really don't blow up ever. Like okay. I can't get past 190 anymore if I try. Okay. Got you. All right. Well, that's, that's good to know. Good to know that you're kind of like settled in that weight range now and you're, you know, you're not going to be fluxing around a lot. So your weight cuts can remain consistent finally. Yeah, man. And it's nice because, you know, if somebody calls me for a short notice opportunity, you know, two weeks, can you fight? I'm like, man, I'm in shape. I'm on weight. Like I can be the best version of myself in 10 days. Got you. Like that, okay. that's, that's, that's okay. a big thing. I don't need eight weeks to cut anymore. You know, that, that, that that's <laughs> huge though. Cause it makes a huge yeah. <laughs> difference and not cutting weight for those eight weeks and draining yourself throughout the entire process of like months before the fight, literally for months before the fight. Yeah, man. And it's just, you know, you're, li- you're so much happier. Yeah. Like your do, life, do you, your do you life feel is fresher better. when you fight. Compared to one other 55. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, man. When I was at 55, I only didn't get sick one time. Every time I made a 55, I'd be puking. I'd be, I'd be ill. I remember there was one fight. I went down to Rochester. I fought for the 155 pound, uh, FCP, uh, the strap. And it was, okay. it was, it was rough, man. I made the cut. I started eating and rehydrating and I spent the next 18 hours throwing up. Oh God. I couldn't, I couldn't hold anything down. I was completely dehydrated. Even going into the fight, I couldn't talk. I had lost my voice from throwing up so much that I was like, this is the last time I ever do this. And thank God I never did it again. You know, I went in there and I won, but I felt like shit. And yeah, I wasn't no, even happy that I won like, because my body was so fucked up. <laughs> God, that sounds horrible, though. Seriously. I'm glad that you're in a weight class that that's not constantly happening at now. Yeah, man. No, never again. I'm happy here at 170. I still feel strong as hell. Like, I, I have no reason to go down to 55 at all. So you had your first loss last March. Would, what were some adjustments you made in the training room after that fight? So in the training room, obviously, I think that at that time, I had lacked in a lot of areas of my game that you just, as a young fighter, you know, you just need to put more work into. Like the wrestling, I needed to put more work into just being a little bit more, being a little bit less complacent, you know, like I, I was okay with, you know, sometimes you don't win every round. And especially with the guys I train with, I was losing almost every round when I trained, I'm training with killers. And I think that it just got me into a place where I was like, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. And then in that fight, I was like, Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Until I really wasn't okay. I was in a bad position. I was flattened out. He had my back. He had my, he was, had it on my chin and I thought I was fine. Next thing you know, I was taking a quick nap. So, yeah, that was, it was, you know, decision-making. And as an athlete, you know, the, the more you train, the better you become at making better decisions. But also, you know, I realized that I'm never going to take a fight 10 pounds above my weight class, no matter how much they tell me that I need to. Gotcha. So, okay. you know, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate situation. I lost that fight, but, you know, I, that night I fought a middleweight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. So would you say overall that it was not a positive, but it like taught you a good lesson? Oh man, a hundred percent. You know, I was really never losing before in my career. Like in an amateur, I went undefeated. And for now, like my pro fights, I was like, oh wow, I felt top of the world. So, you know, I didn't feel that urgency as much. And it actually not just made me feel like the desire to win was back but also to know how bad it was to lose it had been a long time since i had lost really in a major sporting event and it just brought back feelings like i love winning but i fucking hate losing more than anything in this world 
So that brought me back to a place where I can now put myself in that mental state. If I'm having hard rounds and I'm losing, I'm like, fuck, this is what it's going to be like in a fight. I got to turn it up. Not, okay, I'm fine. You know, we're still here. You know, that complacent mindset is danger is even more dangerous than being too much fired up. I agree. I agree. Being com- being too complacent sometimes will get you in really bad situations, very bad situations. And yeah, and that's and, what happened, man. Yeah, and it does happen. But I'm glad that you were able to learn from it. I mean, you're still obviously really early on in your career. I mean, losses come with the sport. It's not like it's a bad thing. But I'm just glad that you're able to learn from that. Of course, man. Me too. That's why we're here, right? And Marty, I'm not. I don't want to have a spotless career. I want to yeah. go in there and fight tough motherfuckers. So you had a two year layoff from mid 2017 to mid 2019 but that wasn't like a real layoff it was you went and did a boxing match and you were you were on vacation a couple times i saw so just tell me like you know what you did in that span of time 2017 to 2019 yeah yeah Uh, mma terms you had a two-year layoff in your career a near two-year layoff i think of so i moved so i actually i think so I actually fought. I fought multiple times. Okay. Um, it's just okay. not on my record. Okay. <laughs> um, I fought in Muay Thai. I competed in amateur Muay Thai. Um, and I also fought for Rec MMA in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, so I actually moved up to Thunder Bay for a year for schooling. Uh, I went to the firefighting college up there. Okay. Yes. I okay. And, yeah. So I, it was about a, yeah, about a year and a half. And I, and I unfortunately I had a, a couple of, fallouts with uh or pull out the fight so i couldn't get as much i'd be as active as i'd like but i competed in muay thai uh once and then i also had an, an amateur mma fight so you know it wasn't dead time but okay. that was the okay. time where i was very focused on school um so when i came back here it was like full guns blazing i had one more amateur fight sorry two more amateur fights and then i was like boom let's go okay. pro ranks and we started running it up Talk to me a little bit about that firefighting career. I saw that you were uh, in school for firefighting. How 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 did you get into that? Like, is that something you you'd want to do, or something you do, or what? Um, to be honest, like I I enjoyed doing it. Um, I just at that point I had not a lot of other options with work. Like I had I had been personal training for a long time, and I loved that. Okay. But my parents very much heavily pushed me to go to school, and so. I said that as long as I do have a backup plan, you know, they're a lot more supportive of my career in this, in this sport. Okay. And also I think it's always good. Cause you never know in this sport, if like something happens, like I have to be able to make money. Yeah. Yeah. So if worse comes to worse, like I have a backup, but you know, it's also not something that, you know, I didn't have to sacrifice a huge amount of time for. I didn't have to go to school for four years. Cause I had a lot of friends, a lot of training partners that are in school for four years and they were training kind of half time. I was in school and still training full time. So like it, it was, it was, it was pretty useful and it was, it was a good way to, uh, to make sure that I had, I did have career path in the future. If this didn't, if this is something that I decided I didn't want to do anymore. Yeah. Just a safety net, a backup plan, something that, you know, you could fall back on had this not worked out. Everyone needs yep, something like but, that. I get it. A hundred percent, man. And honestly, it wasn't as much for me as it was for my, the people around me, my family, like they very much wanted that. Um, but doing that, trying to having to take time off of training to go to school, especially up in Thunder Bay where there, you know, there was training, but it not even close to the caliber. I didn't have many training partners that gate. That was almost the same learning experience as losing because I realized that I had lost time when I was up there. And when I came back, it put a fire under my ass. So that is same thing as losing or without having to lose. You know, I realized what I had what I had here, because when I moved up there into a small town, like I did grow up there, so I know everyone there. Um, but it was, you know, there was, I had to drag people to come to training. I had to literally spend all of my free time trying to get even amateur featherweights to come and train with me or heavyweights. Like I was sparring heavyweights that barely had any experience, anyone you know, trying to pick my up. anyone. I was yep. dragging people off the yep. fucking street, man. Um, so it made me have so much appreciation for my training partners and my coaching here, like so much more that it just, it kind of, it made me more grateful and it allowed me to train. It just allowed me to train harder. 
All right, great. That's good to hear that you um that you were able to like appreciate things more after that. It sucks that you had to go through like, you know, like that little rough patch of training and everything to get there, but it made you really appreciate what you had around you, which is great. Oh yeah, so much. So um you've so, been to some beautiful places on vacation, but where would you say is your favorite des- destination, favorite vacation spot? Oh man, that's a hard one. So I'm I'm like a I I love I love warm weather. I if I'm traveling, you couldn't catch me dead going anywhere north. I'm going south all the way. Um probably my two favorite places. It's hard to narrow down like I love Hawaii. Hawaii is beautiful. It's been a family tradition. I've gone there a couple times with my family. I love it there. It is so gorgeous. There's everything you need from the beach to surfing to uh to hiking. And then, it, you know, there's also shopping and, you know, there's downtown cores, there's nightlife, like it's so fun. But, you know, I think that I, the only experience that I could say was was probably one of a kind was was Columbia. That was like one of the most fun trips I ever had. It was it was very, very, very fun. It was very different to go stay in a local resort where, you know, there's no one, there's nobody else there to speak English. You know, the staff doesn't speak English. Like, it was honestly wild and it was that was a lot of fun and also we were staying literally in the rainforest so it was it was it was kind of crazy how do you guide your way through a trip like that if no one speaks english uh so i went with one of my buddies and uh he speaks probably like 20 percent colombian like not 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 much enough to get you through the trip yeah and we constantly had our phones where we didn't have service much like we actually got we were downtown and we couldn't find anyone that would drive us back to our resort like nobody would drive us they would look at us and they drive away man it was it was why and everyone was staring at us like we were two big white guys in the city yeah. and everyone else was these small little hispanic people and it's it was so yeah it was tough we we almost had to spend a night on the streets because we couldn't get a single cab driver who would understand us enough or have the patience with us to sit here and try to uh, us explain to them where we need to go it sounds like you had a fun time, though, huh? <laughs> oh, it was fun, man. It was yeah. fun. We had some crazy experiences there, but uh, okay. yeah, it was, it was, it was. That was like the most memorable trip I think I've ever had. Okay, so Hawaii for inside the U.S. and a Colombia for outside the U.S. Yeah, got it. Okay, sounds good. I uh, <laughs> I still can't get over the sleeping outside. <laughs> imagine oh man, just, yeah. You guys just had to sleep on the street. That'd be hilarious. Yeah. We almost did, man. Like there was literally nothing we could do. It was getting late. It was like starting to get dark. Did you have, and we did were, you have like a plan or like? Well, we were gonna. We went walking downtown, which isn't that far. We took a bus. So we took a bus, and the buses just stopped coming back for whatever reason. They just didn't come back to the place they were supposed to pick us up at. Okay. So, so then, we were like, all right, well, we just gotta get a taxi. Okay, so then, like after that, basically, like you were, you're sitting there, you're stranded. None of the taxis want to deal with you. You can't talk to them. Whatever. What did you have a? Did you like come up with a plan? Like, okay, if we if we have to, we're gonna sleep here. Like, da, 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 or like, no, it was. You didn't get that far we, into it. We didn't get that far because okay. we knew if we were staying okay. tonight, it was gonna be it was gonna be rough because we were downtown. We weren't downtown, you know, Med Medellin, but downtown Bogota. We were downtown Cali, which is not a place you want to be downtown okay. it is probably the most dangerous city in in colombia right now and it okay. it was not it was not ideal so we're getting out of here one way or another um if we got to run back you know we're both athletic we can figure it out um <laughs> we searched out um any hotel we could find and we kept trying to find a hotel we were like hey one of these hotels must have you know like a somebody who deals with foreigners maybe they they're multilingual maybe they they speak other languages and eventually we got we did stumble upon a, a reasonably nice hotel which they the people didn't speak english but they had a bus driver that their job was to drive around the hotel guest and we offered to pay him a crazy amount of money we just like showed him an amount and he's like okay like well what do you need right after a while because nobody would stop for us i don't know what it was and also you know you got to be careful with your phones there can I ask? You, how, you know, you can I ask how much that was USD? Yeah, it was like 150 US dollars, and it wasn't. It was like we were trying to only go like a couple, like not that far, like probably like 10 or 12 kilometers. But uh, yeah, we were like, I don't care, man. Like, just, just get yeah, us you had to get home. home. Yeah, so that was yeah. We ended up 
we just were pulling up our Google translator on our phone, trying to get somebody to, you know, understand us. And they're like, Hey, you need to go here. And also, like I said, we were staying in the middle of nowhere. We were staying on a, it was called the Bombonera, which is just a resort for locals. So like most people don't know what it is. It's built into the side of the mountain. There was like six guest rooms. So most people didn't even know where it was. So we had to find an address. It was, man, it was gorgeous. It was beautiful. It was crazy. Yeah, it would have sucked it was, if you could get back there. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, damn. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the bus ended up t- taking us through the most dangerous street in Cali, which was crazy, man. They were they had people just – they had naked people running around. It was like a prostitution ring. They were like – they were stop, stopping people with AK-47s in their hands. It was – we were we – were concer- we were actually thought that we weren't going to make it back. <laughs> I bet there definitely were points where you guys definitely thought, like, yeah, we're not getting home. Definitely. Yeah. Not. So yeah, right. but I think that's what makes it so memorable, you know. That's great though. I mean, you're obviously <laughs> in good health and back. So obviously everything did go great. And you're saying it's one of your favorite vacations. So definitely had a great yeah, time. Yeah, man. That's hysterical. For sure. All right. <laughs> so um you talked about family motivation and how, you know, just how your family always helps you. I know you have like like you know how you were saying that your family was the ones pushing you to get into firefighting and just have that backup plan. Just tell me how they've been able to push you through your career and motivate you to keep going. Um, like they honestly just seeing how hard my family's worked. Uh, my mom is, you know, 65 years old and she still works full time as a psychologist. Like she does it cause she loves it, not because she needs to. Um, and in the last little while it was, it was rough because the last couple of camps, my dad was very, very sick. Um, and actually, he ended up passing away the night after I was supposed to fight. I'm sorry. To so hear. that was – oh, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, it, it was super unfortunate, but the, the motivation was just so high from that. And it was really unfortunate that my opponent pulled out a couple days before the fight. But, um, you know, it's – that motivation, like, it's it, to see how he was sick and he still wanted me to push through this. And, you know, it's, it's different for somebody who – like, like my, my parents both came from a very traditional background. My mom was a psychologist. My dad's a dentist um, where they wanted me to pursue education and to see their son, uh, one of four, the only ones that didn't pursue a doctorate or something along those lines. He just wants to fight. Um, I think it was very (laughs) complete opposite, man. My sister's a psychologist as well. My brother was a chiropractor. Uh, My other brother's a nurse. Uh, Like it's, they all pursued very, very traditional careers. They, they work very hard. And then they're like, what the fuck is this guy doing, man? Like, <laughs> I'm out here. <laughs> Where did we go wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, man. They're flying out to Sault Ste. Marie to watch me fight in a, in, a, in a hockey arena on a native reserve with 15 people where they don't even announce your name. You just walk in and fight. They oh, were like, what? That's great. Like, what happened? But you know what, man? They always showed up. They came no matter where I fought. And so the support. At first, I think the first couple of amateur fights, they really hated it. They despised it. They didn't want to know anything about it. But, you know, they saw how disciplined I was. They saw how much effort I put in. They saw that I was having success. And then since I turned pro, like, I started to have more fights, started to have more success. I started to, like, they just see the discipline that I put in and the hard work I put in. And uh, I think that they, they understand it significantly more now. As much as they still hate it, they, uh, yeah, they very much support me beyond what I could have ever expected them to. Good. It's great to hear that you have such a good support system behind you. And also, again, sorry about your dad, but it, it's great. It's just great to hear that, you know, like you're able to motivate you in so many ways and like, you know, just push you and just, it, 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 but it's funny that you just went the complete opposite route as everyone else. Like they motivated you, but kind of in the wrong way. Like you, like you said, like they all, all of your siblings work hard, right? So do you but it just in a complete different way. So it's, it's, I mean, there's always the one, there's always the one that's going to be different. And that's it. Yeah. hundred percent. It couldn't be any further from, from the rest. So you, you, this is the last question, but you have some goals. Just tell me what you want to accomplish in your career. I want to fight at the highest level, man. I want to fight at the highest level, whether that's TFL, whether it's UFC, whether it's Bellator, like I do not care. I want to fight against the best guys in the world. And I want to see myself at a point in my career, maybe in the next five to six years where I can do this as complete. Like I don't have to work any other job. 
this is I want to be able to get to a point where I can live a lifestyle of this of this like full time. I want to commit myself to the sport 100%. Like I train full time hours, but I still work, and like that shit's hard. So my biggest goal right now is getting to a point where I can sustainably train full time. And once I can do that that is a point where I feel like I'm going to be at the top of the world and I can, anything will be, a, I can accomplish anything. Got it. All right, Bobby, thank you for your time. I appreciate everything. It was, uh, of course, it was great talking to you and I, uh, I, I wish you luck in your fight. I appreciate it, buddy. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thank you, my guy. Have a good one.